Great, thank you very much. So I thought I'd start today just by introducing myself and explaining a little bit more about how I came to have the quite unusual job that I'm now lucky enough to have. So um, as uh, David uh, alluded to, I started life as a psychologist interested in the human mind. And I've ended up chasing chimpanzees around the jungles of Africa. So how have I made this transition? Well, after I'd done my degree in psychology, I was offered a PhD to study chimpanzee communication. And when I was offered it, I thought, why not? What an amazing adventure. Unfortunately, my enthusiasm for the choice wasn't shared by all members of my family. And grandma, notably, when hearing the news, said, E, love, why on earth do you want to go and do that? I can't think of out worse. Um, <laughs> And Grandma remains a sceptic to this day um, of why I have such a fascination with chimpanzees. But for me, it's been one of the best choices I've ever made. Um, and it's enabled me to become um, an evolutionary psychologist. So this means I'm interested in how the human mind has evolved through time. So I'm interested in questions like, what makes the human mind special compared to other animals? Um, is it our culture? Is it our memory? What about our language? And language in particular interests me. And I really would love to know and understand more. How did language evolve? So now you know the kind of questions I'm interested in. Um, how can studying chimps actually help me to answer these? So here I've illustrated um, how we are related to some other members of the primate family. Now, so what I'm interested in is really tracing back through our ancient past and trying to understand what were our mental capacities like in uh, millions and millions of years ago. And by doing this, we can try and understand how things have changed to result in the modern human mind that we see today. So by um, studying other animals that are very closely related to us, what we can try and do is actually reconstruct the now extinct common ancestors that we actually shared with those creatures. Um, and so the kind of logic is that if we take a mental ability that we know humans have got, so say self-recognition, we know that bonobos and chimpanzees can also do that, um, so we make the inference or the estimate that our last common ancestor was also capable of that thing, of that ability. And so by comparing um, human abilities to those um, of, of our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees and bonobos, we can try and map out which of our mental abilities are actually really ancient with their roots right back in our primate lineage and which are actually probably evolved since we split off from the rest of the human, sorry, from the rest of the primate lineage and are really the things that make our minds unique. They're the things that make us special as humans. So that's the logic of why I, I study chimpanzees and I've particularly tried to apply this comparative approach to try and understand how we evolved language. So human language is the most complex communication system that we know of in the natural world. So what do we need in order to communicate with language? Well, first of all, we have to have the motivation or the intention to communicate with others. Our words have to have meaning. So when I say bottle, you know that I'm referring to this object here. Um, and I don't just say my words in any old order. Uh, my language is highly structured and rule governed. So take the simple sentence, Lucy kicked the horse, and you may get uh, an image like this in your head. Take exactly the same words, but put them in a different structure, and you get a very, very different meaning. So we know that language is incredibly complex, and we have all of these abilities and more that enable us to communicate in this very complicated way. But to try and understand its evolution, one way to go about this is to actually say, well, let's take each of these elements that we know that we need for language and with each of these elements ask which of these are uniquely human or to what extent actually might they be older and shared and therefore maybe we'll be able to find something similar in chimpanzee communication. So when it comes to chimpanzees, what do they communicate about? So chimpanzees are incredibly social creatures. Um, they live in a very complex uh, social environment. So many of their vocalizations help them to navigate 
um, those social interactions. So when a subordinate individual greets a dominant, he pank grunts <laughs> um, as he greets him. When chimpanzees uh, uh, fight, they scream. They scream to try and recruit others to come and help them in the fight. But chimpanzees also communicate about their surrounding environment. And one really important aspect of that is food. So whether that's bananas in the case of captivity or figs in the case of wild, chimpanzees produce a range of different calls when they're feeding. So to let you hear what that sounds like, um, I've got a recording from the wild. Um, so this is Michelle. Um, she's just started to feed. I'm on this lovely fig tree. Um, and this is the kind of noises that she makes. Okay, so um, when I first heard this and started to observe it, I thought, well, what is it that Michelle is communicating to the other chimpanzees in her group? Is she telling them that simply there's food here? Or is she telling them something more specific? Could she be telling them about the quality of the food that she's found? Or even more specific, maybe it's actually the type of food that she's discovered. So when I was observing this, my thought was, well, maybe these calls are actually acting in a similar way to my words are. Maybe they really are referring to very specific things in their external world. Um, so in order to test this, the first step was to establish um, whether the chimpanzees give different calls for different types or qualities or quantities of food. Now, I started to try and address this in the wild, but unfortunately, it's really difficult to assess uh, things like just the quantity of food available in the wild. And this video will show you why. So this is Marnie, um, and he's eating figs. Each one of these yellow balls is a fig. And I'd just like you to estimate how many figs are in this tree. So as the, as the camera pans out, you'll see that there's another two chimps feeding above him. Okay, so I hope you appreciate the, the, the kind of level of challenge that I faced there. So I thought, okay, to get a handle on what they might be communicating about, it's really hard in the wild. So for this study, I'll come to back to captivity. And so in captivity, I started with just trying to assess what do the chimpanzees think um, of the food quality that they receive. So I started just by objectively giving them a choice. So I throw in a bucket of oranges with a bucket of apples, bucket of apples with a bucket of bananas. And I simply recorded which food do you pick first? And I did this all possible pairwise comparisons of two different types of food um, until I could um, establish with some kind of degree of, of certainty that they were foods that the chimpanzees really valued. So we ended up with three really high preference foods, three medium preference foods and three low preference foods. And then I went about recording the kind of sounds that the chimpanzees gave when they encountered these foods. So when they found food that they really loved, that was high value, uh, the chimpanzees would give that kind of call. It's similar to what you heard Michelle doing when she was eating the figs. Um, so this is a visualisation of the sound. Um, and you can see, um, so we've got time running along uh, here, frequency running up here. Um, and you can see that these calls are quite long. And they've also got quite a lot of energy in these higher frequencies. And as their preference for the food decreases, the calls get lower in frequency and they get shorter. And that's the same chimp responding to a low value food, in that case, apples. Um, and it's a, it's a very graded system, so the, the medium preference are somewhat in between those two. So, we rec I recorded all these sounds and I then went about measuring them very precisely and we found that yes, the callers really do seem to be using this variation in their calling system systematically. So the high preference foods get these ah, ah, ah calls, the low preference ones get these ah, ah, ah ones. Um, but I thought, well, as a human, I can do more than just tell someone this is great food or this is not very nice food. I can tell them I'm eating apples, grapes, bananas. Are the chimps capable of being more specific? 
So for this, we looked to see if the food um, in the low preference category, if they labelled the types of food differently. But we found that apples, greens and carrots got exactly the same kind of calls. Same thing at the medium preference level. So uh, grapes, plums and chow, again, got very, very similar calls. But at the high preference end, I have to say much to our surprise, we found that the chimps gave distinct calls to mangoes, bread and bananas. And we, followed the, we tracked these calls over different days, and again, they seemed very consistent. So it really did seem that in this particular captive setting, the callers are not, able, not only capable of labelling the value of the food source, but also the actual specific food types. So this was a level of, of specificity that we really hadn't expected to find. So that was great. Um, but it's never enough in communication to just look at the production. Because maybe as scientists, I've gone about and measured these calls and maybe I've picked up on some regularities that the other chimps don't really understand. For this to be proper communication about the food, the listening chimps have to understand what these calls are referring to. So um, we went about um, trying to ask, are these calls meaningful labels to the ones who are listening to them? And so for this, we had to do what's called a playback experiment. So I'm just going to walk you through how we went about testing this. So we had a very simple design. We simply wanted to know, can the chimpanzees distinguish between low value grunts given to apples, the <laughs> ones, or the high value grunts given to bread, the <laughs> ones. So um, again, I conducted this study at Edinburgh Zoo, um, and this is a plan of the old enclosure. So the zoo has since built the chimps an amazing £6 million enclosure, which is absolutely fantastic for them. But this is the outdoor enclosure of the old, um, old uh, facility. And it had a concrete gully running along this wall, um, and the chimps couldn't see into that gully until they came really right up on top of it. So it enabled me basically to give me two places where I could hide food for them. Um, so what we did is we established over a number of weeks um, two trees. And these trees uh, fruited regularly, and the bread tree produced tubes full of bread, and the apple tree produced tubes full of apples. Um, and we also had a few rules. So um, to stop the chimps just sitting here waiting for the bread tree to produce its wonderful fruit, um, we had the contingency that although both trees fruited their tubes together, only one set of tubes was actually uh, full. So in reality, it meant we threw in bread tubes and empty tubes or apple tubes and empty tubes. And this also got the chimps into the habit that they actually really had to get down and actually look through all the tubes to find uh, which location has actually got food in it. So we did this for a number of uh, weeks until we were happy that the chimps had learnt that this is where apples appear and this is where bread appears. So then we were ready to test their understanding. So we popped a speaker equidistant between the two trees. So we never gave them a cue as to which the correct tree was based on the speaker position. Then I asked the keepers to get all the chimpanzees inside um, so they couldn't see what I was doing. Whilst they weren't looking, I snuck empty, tree, empty tubes under both trees. So this is really important. So we never rewarded them for any behaviour. So on a test trial, because I was interested in what they can naturally understand with these calls, not what I could train them to associate with these calls. So then we'd wait for the first individual to come out and then we would play him back a group member's call given to either apples or bread and then saw where he went to search for food. So at the beginning of the study, I had great plans to test maybe eight, nine of the 11 available chimps. I knew not all of them would want to play my game. But Liberius had other plans for me. So this is six-year-old Liberius, the youngest member of the group, and he just loved this game. He thought the tubes were brilliant. So he made his mission to always, without fail almost, to be the first one out. Whenever they went inside, he'd always rush out to see, oh, I wonder if that weird woman's put those things under those trees again. Um, so in the end, we had to admit defeat and uh, we had to just focus on Liberius. So the results I'll show you are from Liberius only, which obviously is a bit of a weakness. But I'm pleased to tell you that I went to Leipzig in Germany and the German chimps do the same thing. So I'm now happy that this is no longer uh, an exceptional chimp. 
So what did Liberius do? So when he heard apple grunts, um, he went and he searched for longer and he searched more tubes under the um, bread tree than he uh, did under the apple tree. And when he heard apple grunts, he did exactly the opposite. So he then went and spent longer searching under the apple tree than he did under the bread tree. So this, uh, by looking at his behaviour, we were able to deduce that he must understand the content or the information in those calls. So what does this tell us? Let's go back to the big picture about the evolution of our own linguistic abilities. Well, so we now know that this ability to refer to things in the external world with our, our sounds, we know that humans can do it, we do it all the time. This showed us that chimpanzees can also do it. And after this work, um, we also know that bonobos can do this. So we've got pretty strong evidence now that our last common ancestor six million years ago was probably also capable of this kind of uh, communication. And this work sits really nicely with actually older work that's shown that actually quite a number of species of monkey can also communicate in this way. So rather than just this last common ancestor, about six million years being capable of this, this actually probably represents a really ancient ability that our last common ancestor with the old world monkeys, maybe 30 million years ago, might have been capable of. So that's a, a, a kind of a whistle-stop tour um, around some of the, the studies I've, I've done. But is the story that I've told you so far, is it really that simple? So when humans... Um, use these referential words like apple, bottle. We do it intentionally to tell each other about the external world. When a chimp does the same thing, gives the uh, uh, uh calls to apples, is he doing it to share information with other group members? Or is he just excited? Can he, can he control this vocalisation? Maybe it's just an automatic response he can't really control when he sees apples. And other chimpanzees have learnt to interpret that as a meaningful signal. So this is something I'm now um, looking at in the wild. Um, so we're trying to run experiments in the wild now to really try and test why are the chimps making these calls? What motivates them? What are their intentions? And work in the wild um, is fantastic. I'm incredibly lucky to do it. Um, but as you can see from the myriad of different creatures we encounter, um, it's a, a huge adventure um, and uh, fantastic, but also a real challenge to get the science done. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you.